cannabis common sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. nothing on the scale of the Seattle Hemp Fest other than the Seattle Hemp Fest. So uh, for those who haven't seen it, it is incredibly empowering. And I, I think 12, 13 years now I've been coming in. Uh, I just, uh, I find it fascinating. And I think people in other parts of the country are beginning to pick up on that same phenomena. And uh, the Boston Freedom Fest is coming up in the month, and that's a wonderful thing on the Boston Common with all the history associated with that. Uh, and in the, the Port Portland uh, Hemp Sock, and uh, that's about the middle of next month as well. I was there last year. So, so 12th and 13th of September. 12th and 13th of September. Uh, if you're in the region at all, and you identify with marijuana smokers or as marijuana smoking, for Christ's sake, come to this thing. Uh, you will find lots of people that are like-minded individuals like you. And uh, as I say, you'll feel empowered by it. He's got an understanding that we're doing here. He's got an understanding. Save your seeds. It doesn't take a miracle to cultivate the weed. You can't sell brownies, you can't sell pot, you can't sell Rice Krispies at Hemp Fest. Why? Because we know how to keep this thing going, and that will bring us down. We have an unprecedented amount of freedom here. No other city in the world, no other rally in, in America especially. I don't think any in the world is doing quite what we're doing. So, so please understand, we do not want to be the narcs, man. In the midsummer, the state of California determined that it would be missing $1.4 billion in taxes if we didn't legalize it in California. Probably 10 times that many nationally. We've helped almost 100,000 people in eight states thanks, uh, get a medical marijuana permit. So that means they can legally possess, use, and grow medical marijuana. Medical marijuana is a great step forward, but it's not the end. What we need to do is end adult marijuana prohibition, restore industrial hemp, and help medical marijuana patients. The man who started all, Jack Miller. This will be the future of all mankind, or there won't be a future. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican, we're going to legalize marijuana no matter what happens in 10 years, because when 60% of the American public wants something, they're going to get it. 
contact your legislators. Tell them in marijuana prohibition, it's time to tax and regulate it. The more letters they get like that, the sooner the day will arrive. We're going to legalize marijuana! Peaceful! Look at this, it doesn't have any... What if this was a drink fest? Alcohol fest, meth fest, heroin fest, cocaine fest. There'd be dead people here. There'd be fights, there'd be stabbings. But it's pot fest, it's hemp fest. We are proud, we are loud. Give me an H! I freaking love Hempfest. Hempfest is the shit. Hempfest is badass. <laughs> Go Hempfest! Foundation, the THC Foundation. They are the event sponsor of Hemp Fest this year. So THC Foundation presents Seattle Hemp Fest. He's also the author and chief, chief petitioner of the Tax and Regulate Bill in Oregon. Give a warm Seattle welcome to Paul Stanford. Thank you, Vivian. Most inspirational speaker in hip. Hey, Seattle Hemp Fest. Wake up, it's almost 420. Pretty quick, you know, we have helped in our clinics almost 100,000 people get a legal medical marijuana permit. How many of you out there have got one? Raise your hands if you got a legal medical marijuana permit here. All right, you know you are. If you have one of those conditions, hey, give us a call. We have doctors who can help you all across this state. And uh, we want to see more and more patients become legal, especially if they have a condition. But, you know, that's not the end all and be all. There's nothing I would like better than to see our medical clinics become kind of a, a side issue. And I want to see complete legal marijuana for every adult. I want to see us all able to grow our own crop where we don't have to go down and get a license. It's just a, a God-given right to be able to grow the plant that produces more fiber, more protein, and more oil than any other plant on this planet. Amen, brother. So we're working to do that through our uh, political committee. And if you want to find out more about it, go to hemp.org. That's H-E-M-P.org. We have an initiative petition we're pushing in Oregon for 2010 to end adult marijuana prohibition and restore industrial hemp. If we get it on the ballot and win the election, which is a hard one, then marijuana be legal January 1st, 2011. Just a year and a half from now, you know, the Berlin Wall fell very, very quickly, and I think we can end marijuana prohibition. We've been waiting a couple generations to see some progress on this, and finally, it's moving forward. So go to hemp.org, get involved in the movement to end adult marijuana prohibition, and stop putting honest Americans in prison for supporting a plant that can save the planet. I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks for having us. And restore him. D. Paul Stanford from the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation. Seattle Hemp Fest event sponsor this year. Also runs a great television show down in Oregon as well. You just had your 500th show or something like that. How many people ever heard of Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws? Are you prepared to show some love to the guy that started it all? 
like over 30 years ago when there was no marijuana movement? He started something which gave birth to the marijuana movement. Keith Stroop, the, exec the former executive director of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws and the founder of Normal. Thank you, everyone. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. Five-year-old lawyer. I first smoked pot when I was a freshman at Georgetown Law School in 1965, and I've been a regular smoker ever since. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults, and it's time we stopped the resting and started respecting responsible marijuana smokers. As uh, Viv was nice to point out. Years ago, I think it was now 39 years ago, I, I founded Normal. Um, I served as executive director for a couple of decades, and I currently serve as legal counsel. Normal has now, for almost four decades, represent, represented the interest of responsible marijuana smokers in public policy debates in this country. We are the marijuana smokers lobby in America, and we're proud of it. We favor the elimination of all penalties for the possession and use of marijuana, and it doesn't matter whether you use it for medical purposes or whether you smoke it because you like to get high. It's none of the government's business. We also favor the eventual establishment of a legally regulated market where consumers can buy their marijuana in a safe and secure environment. That's generally called legalization. And equally as important, we support the consumer's right to grow marijuana because as long as you have the right to grow your own, that makes sure that the marketplace is going to offer you good quality marijuana at a fair price. Personal cultivation is important. It is time for those of us who smoke marijuana to get up, stand up, light up, and let the world know how we feel. We must, we must come out of the closet. Now, it's true, by the way, that marijuana smoking increases your appreciation for good food, for good music, and for good sex. And those are not bad goals. But it does more than that. Those girl goals are quite worth pursuing, but for millions of us, it enhances our life. It allows us to stand back a step, to be a little detached, to, to view our personal life, to view our professional life. Therefore, tens of millions of Americans smoking marijuana can be a positive, enriching experience, and we must develop the courage to say that publicly. Amen, brother. Just as gays and lesbians failed to win their rights in this country, until large numbers of courageous individuals were willing to come out of the closet, that's what has to happen with us. Number one, you must vote. If you don't vote, you're part of the problem. Number two, when you vote, it's important to let your elected official know how important this issue is to you. And finally, you must take a pledge that you will never again vote for a candidate for public office that wants to treat you like a criminal. There were 26 million Americans smoked marijuana just in the last year. If we all took the pledge to never again vote for a candidate unless they were willing to support our freedom, we'll end marijuana prohibition in a couple of election cycles. Now the bad news. There were 871,000 arrests last year in this country for marijuana. 89% of those were for simple possession. They were just marijuana smokers, people like you and me. There were more people arrested on marijuana charges than for all violent crimes in this country combined, and that's rape and robbery and murder and aggravated assault. There's another marijuana smoker arrested every 38 seconds in America. It is time we stop arresting marijuana smokers, and there's three basic reasons. One is we're spending an estimated $10 billion a year chasing and arresting and prosecuting otherwise law-abiding citizens simply because when they relax in the evening, they prefer to smoke a joint. That's idiotic, and it's a waste of law enforcement resources. Number two, 
prohibition invites the government into private areas of our life that are simply inappropriate. Yeah. Most Americans agree we don't want the government coming into our house to know what books we read, uh, the subject of our, uh, of our music we listen to, and certainly we don't want them knowing and watching the, our behavior in the bedroom. Well, neither do they have any basis to get involved in the decision as to whether we smoke marijuana or drink alcohol when we relax in the evening. Now, the good news. The good news is that when you ask the public how they feel about marijuana penalties, you find that roughly 80% now say they support the right of a seriously ill patient to use medical marijuana when a doctor recommends it. 80%, 8 out of 10 Americans. Well then, how come we've only won that in 13 states, for Christ's sake? It's because we need to take that support and convert it into public policy. We know now that 76% of the public, three out of four Americans, agree with us on the basic premise that you should not arrest and jail a marijuana smoker. 76%, three out of four. So we have largely won the hearts and minds of the American public. Our challenge is to convert that into public policy. By the way, more recently, there was a poll taken nationwide by Zogby, the normal commission, that showed 52% of the public nationwide now favor not just decriminalizing marijuana, but legalizing it. Legalizing it, taxing it, regulating it like we do alcohol. And one survey by the Field Coal Company in California found 56% of the people in California now support legalization. So, what does this all mean? Well, it means, honestly, we're about to win this issue. We're getting very close to it. I think definitely in your lifetime, I hope in mine, but within five years, I think we're going to stop arresting marijuana smokers in this country, and the first few states are going to begin to experiment with legally regulated markets. Uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy, in writing for the majority in the U.S. Supreme Court recently, in a case, said the following. At the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of the human life. It is the promise of the Constitution that there is a realm of personal liberty where the government may not enter. Well, as I said when I started, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults, and it is of no interest to the government, and they should stop arresting and start respecting marijuana smokers. In the end, we are only incidentally talking about marijuana. We are really talking about personal freedom. Join normal, stand up, legalize marijuana. Thank you. Goodman, uh, I first met when he was part of the King County Bar Association and working on uh, uh, drug policy issues. And since then, uh, he's gone on to uh, a higher elected office. And so, welcome uh, Roger Goodman, uh, one of your uh, Seattle State Senators. Thanks, Felipe. You're elected too, aren't you? Yeah, Felipe, he's an elected official as well. Yeah, I've been working with the King County Bar Association for almost a decade now, uh, organizing lawyers and doctors and other stuffed stuff shirts. Uh, to give the professional voice to drug policy reform, to give uh, opinion leaders and policymakers some cover. Uh, and uh, now uh, the Voluntary Committee of Lawyers that I direct is working nationally with bar associations and all, uh, other professional groups all across the country to do the same thing, to get lawyers, and uh, particularly lawyers, but uh, professionals to speak up uh, about drug policy and uh, give some courage to policymakers to take action. And as Philippe said, I'm also an elected official. I'm vice chair of the House Judiciary Committee here in the Washington State Legislature. Uh, and in that capacity, I'm one of a few, uh, uh, very few lawyers in the legislature. Um, and my drug policy work in the legislature is uh, at the salad bar or in you know sort of rooms that you don't you don't see my work in the legislature. It's very quiet, very subtle, uh, sort of testing the waters. Uh, giving some of my colleagues some uh, uh, different ways to frame the issue, that this isn't about drugs, this is about fiscal responsibility, this is about protecting our children better, this is about providing health care, uh, this is about cleaning up public spaces and so forth. Uh, we're getting close to a tipping point. Uh, and so uh, my quiet work in the legislature is working with the other suits, uh, but my not so quiet work out in the uh, professional world, and we're making more noise now because this uh, we're clearly at a point where 
uh, drug policy is not just a marginal issue anymore. It's, it's really been mainstreamed, and, and folks understand uh, that it's a strategic issue. Uh, so uh, my off-campus, off the Capitol campus, uh, my work involves uh, getting those bar associations across the country, such as Colorado, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, New York. Massachusetts Bar Association just released a report two weeks ago. It's on the desk of every Massachusetts state legislator, and the title is, with a nice seal on it, it says, The Failure of the War on Drugs, Charting a New Course for the Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. You don't even have to open it. It says the failure of the war on drugs, and it's on the desk of the state legislature. So it's just sort of seeping into their minds, you know. And that's that's kind of what we're doing is uh, giving legislators a sense that this is not an issue to be afraid of. Uh, and I, I'll make one more comment in that vein. Uh, when I first ran for office, my opponent uh, hit me hard on the drug policy issue. Uh, that I was going to be selling drugs to kids. Uh, you know, I wanted to be the state uh, director of drug dealing. Uh, all these uh, sort of things, and my poll numbers went up afterward. Okay? So the people get it. Now, one final note in that. Two years later, I ran for re-election against my esteemed colleague, uh, Toby Nixon, and, and please give Toby a hand, because he is a great... Uh, so, okay, so remember, in my first election, I was hit hard for wanting to sell drugs to kids, and I was this evil guy. Two years later, I run against an opponent who agrees with us that we need to reform drug policy, and in public, Toby criticized me for not being uh, aggressive enough on <laughs> drug policy. So in a two-year period, we've come a long way. So. Uh, I, think that, I think that's, uh, that's fantastic. Thanks a lot, Roger. It's uh, worthwhile mentioning when I ran for office, it was uh, I had no trouble at the medical marijuana issue, the fact that I distribute medical marijuana never became a political issue. I had more trouble uh, convincing people to vote green than to vote for a medical marijuana distributor. So I was a Green Party candidate, but... Uh... The first law governing marijuana required all farmers in the Virginia colony to actually grow hemp, the fiber produced by the marijuana plant. Hemp was valuable because you could use its fibers for rope and canvas, its seeds for soap and lamp oil. Most of the sails and ropes on colonial ships were made from hemp, as were many of the colonists' clothing, maps, and even Bibles. Both the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution were written on hemp parchment. In 1850, marijuana is put in the U.S. pharmacopoeia. Doctors are using and prescribing marijuana in the United States beginning in the 1850s. It is sold by the legitimate drug companies. And marijuana policy remained that way for almost a century. Then along came Harry J. Anslinger. He earned his living chasing rum runners during Prohibition. He became commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in 1930. At that time, it was becoming apparent that Prohibition was losing public support, and Anslinger shifted his focus from alcohol to marijuana. Anslinger utilized the press, whipping up public hysteria with exaggerated claims of the evils of the devil weed. There's no doubt, I think, when you look at this history, that um, the, the uh, enactment of marijuana prohibition, both at the state level and then at the national level was not based on science at all. The story of Harry Anslinger's role in the prohibition of marijuana and the criminalization of marijuana users is a very interesting story. It's almost comical when you go back and you read some of the, uh, the newspaper accounts and some of the rhetoric surrounding the prohibition of marijuana to see these uh, incredibly exaggerated assertions uh, such as that you know, marijuana would take normal people upon smoking it and make them assassins overnight or that inevitably it would lead to insanity you know, in a larger sense to uh, debauchery and immorality. Mastery. What Anslinger did is basically sort of assemble all these forces and kind of harness all this energy against marijuana as the assassin of youth and use it 
as the tool for promoting the adoption of the Uniform Narcotic Drug Act, and it worked. A few years later, Anslinger would achieve his ultimate goal, the passage of the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. The uh, Marijuana Tax Act was passed at the national level in 1937, and that um, the story about the prohibition of marijuana was basically a story emerging in the 1930s uh, and largely driven by Harry Anslinger. New immigrant populations were changing the face of American society, and alcohol prohibition had given rise to organized crime and increased violence. Anslinger played the race card and the fear card, as politicians so often have in America, and it worked. 50% of the violent crimes committed in districts occupied by Mexicans, Greeks, Turks, Filipinos, Spaniards, Latin Americans, and Negroes may be traced to the use of marijuana. I believe in some cases one cigarette might develop a homicidal mania, probably to kill his brother. If the hideous monster Frankenstein came face to face with the monster marijuana, he would drop dead of fright. Harry J. Anslinger. To learn more and to obtain a free copy of the informational booklet, Marijuana, It's Time for a Conversation, please visit marijuanaconversation.org. During the hearings before Congress on the Marijuana Tax Act, the lone dissenting voice was Dr. William Woodward of the American Medical Association. Dr. Woodward pointed out that all of Anslinger's testimony was based on hearsay and exaggerated newspaper editorials, and that Congress had not been presented one single shred of actual evidence of marijuana's supposed dangers. Harry Anslinger remained head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics from 1930 until 1962. And in those 30 years, he was pretty busy building up his bureaucracy, primarily because he wanted to protect the jobs of all of the alcohol prohibition agents who no longer had work to do after alcohol prohibition was repealed. So a lot of his anti-marijuana propaganda was designed to make sure that there would be full employment for them. You know, and ironically, even though he's building that bureaucracy all that time and starting to put into, these, into place these very harsh penalties and harsh sentences, the popularity of marijuana was continuing to grow, especially in the 60s when it all of a sudden became a political symbol for unrest and civil disobedience. So how does Nixon react? His popularity is slipping. He's got people parading in the streets about the war. So he drops one war, takes up a new one. That's right. In 1970, President Nixon appointed a blue ribbon panel to study the impact of marijuana on our society. It was commonly known as the Schaefer Commission, named after the Republican governor of Pennsylvania who chaired the panel. But the Schaefer Commission made some unexpected recommendations. Oh, there is a commission that is supposed to make recommendations to me about this subject. It became apparent how little was really known about the effects of this drug and how little evidence there was to support the claims about its dangers. The way that we framed it was that there was no current evidence that occasional use, moderate use, which some called recreational use, of marijuana by basically psychologically healthy people was harmful. The recommendation of the uh, commission in its first report is that we do not feel that private use or private possession in one's own home should have the stigma of criminalization, that uh, people who experiment should not be criminalized for that particular behavior. Eventually, we had endorsements from the American Bar Association, from the American Medical Association, from the American Public Health Association, the National Education Association. I'm sure there were many, many others. But mainstream institutions in American society said, yes, this is the right way to go about dealing with this problem. And eventually, over the period from 1973 to 1977, you had uh, uh, 12 states uh, that actually did adopt the commission's recommendation and, and, and decriminalized. President Nixon just wasn't happy with the Schaefer Commission's findings. No, he wasn't, because he had appointed a number of conservatives to the commission, expecting that they would give him information that would justify his calling for a war on drugs. But instead, they came back and recommended decriminalizing marijuana. He did not expect that, nor did he expect that so many of the country's experts and professional associations would agree with that recommendation. I think we have a question from our audience. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, exactly what does decriminalization mean? The term decriminalization typically means that you don't get arrested, you don't wind up with any sort of criminal record. And in some states there can be no penalty whatsoever for the private possession of small amounts of marijuana by adults. In other states you might have to pay a civil fine like you would for a parking ticket. You know, there was a prior study back in uh, 1938. Mayor LaGuardia of New York commissioned this study on marijuana because he had been acquainted with an army study while he was in the House of Representatives. And in 1944, that study was published saying that, in fact, marijuana was a relatively harmless substance. So twice in recent history, back in the 40s and then with Nixon, politicians have taken information and discarded it and put out false information on marijuana to, to further their political needs. What happens to the legal system when something like this goes on? Well, the result is a loss of respect for the law. Hmm. And Mayor LaGuardia understood that when he worked so hard for the repeal of prohibition. Prohibition cannot be enforced for the simple reason that the majority of American people do not want it enforced and are resisting its enforcement. That being so, the orderly thing to do under our form of government is to abolish a law which cannot be enforced, a law which the people of the country do not want enforced. Alan St. Pierre has been uh, the executive director of Normal for a number of years. He's been involved in the organization since uh, the dawn of the organization. So welcome, uh, Alan St. Pierre. Thank you for leaving. <laughs> I hardly have to tell anybody here that at the moment we're existing right now in this epoch is the busiest period ever and the most positive for cannabis law reform. So for those of us who have gray hair and been at this a long time, it feels good to see, to see this start to turn. If you are under 30 or so, um, you're really fortunate to be on this part of the crest of the wave. <clears throat> but, for example, uh, Dale brought up the fact that in California, Tommy Amiano's bill uh, is at the vanguard of legalization. But how many co-sponsors does it have? None. None. So we still have this huge gap between the zeitgeist we have here in this park and frankly in my travels around, around the United States, even in the Texases, the Georgias, the Louisianas, the change is afoot, but trying to get the culture to impact the politicians is still really, really tough. This past year, meaning the legislation, legislative session, there were 26 states that had 37 bills. Very active period of time. There are still three bills in Congress. First time ever there's been a hemp bill, a decrim bill, and a medical bill all at the same time. But are we going to get subcommittee hearings? Maybe. The administration, who's in charge both at the executive level and at the congressional level, are pretty much in our camp. Those senators who run the most important committees are our allies. In the House, even more so. But the priorities that the country has, the economy, health care. Mrs. Pelosi, who is probably the most powerful politician in the country, comes from San Francisco. She's the longest recipient of support from drug policy reformers, and yet her staff has been very clear. You have to have forbearance. You have to have patience. You have to not agitate us while we have all these other really important things on our plate. And the balancing act is terrific because as somebody who's on K Street, I do appreciate that their plate is full of huge issues. At the same time, we're not gonna abate. So that balance, that balance between trying to get the citizenry active enough and the politicians to take this up. So it's an amazing period of time. 
but we still have so much more work to do, I can hardly tell you. The internet and the ability to communicate amongst ourselves and social networking, I think is gonna push us over the top, along with, for me, the fulcrum is always the baby boom generation. As I'm 43, my mother's 63. As the baby boom generation takes over the institutions of government, education, entertainment, law, um, they have a very different attitude about marijuana than my grandmother, who is 85 years old. And while she will appreciate, and that will be a sad thing for my family, socially, culturally, we'll see that change. So this is all afoot right now, and I know most people who come to these events are already involved, so it's redundant for me to say, please get involved. Just double your efforts this year, because we're this much closer than we were over the last 35 years. Uh, I, I absolutely agree, Alan, and I think that if uh, anything, um, my work in drug policy and drug policy reform has taught me more than anything else, more than about anything I might know about medical marijuana, it's taught me about patience, courage, and determination. And the people that work on this issue have, have that, and I've learned that from mentors uh, uh, around me. And so thank you for your hard work and continued hard work. This morning on today's woman's so-called stiletto stoners, educated, career-minded women who regularly smoke marijuana. The topic is highlighted in a recent article in Marie Claire, and here is one woman's story we should point out that she asked us to disguise her identity. I am a book editor. I've worked in publishing for several years now. I often smoke pot when I get home from work. The stereotypical pothead depicted by Hollywood. This is it, man. This is what your grandchildren are going to be smoking. The jobless, loveless slacker. This weed is fantastic. Is not the only type of person getting stoned. Educated, career-minded, successful women like this 30-something admitted pot smoker are also lighting up. I look at it as just sort of a way to unwind and just relax and sort of decompress. According to a recent study, 8 million women in America smoke marijuana in the past year. For me, it's the equivalent of having a glass of wine at the end of a long day. An illegal habit she's keeping private. At my current job, no one knows that I smoke. My family does know. It's obviously not something that they're super happy about. But on the other hand, I have a career. In one month, she'll spend roughly two or three hundred dollars for approximately half an ounce. And even though it's against the law, she's neither worried about getting caught nor becoming addicted. I don't walk down the sidewalk blazing joints. I don't sit in the park next to moms with kids and smoke. I, I'm not worried about addiction. I feel like I'm more addicted to coffee than anything else. And I'm sure millions of people can say the same. The changing face of pot smokers. But you're so smart and so together and so organized and you're always on time. And I'm like, yes, I am all of those things and I do smoke pot. It's not impossible. Joanna Coles is the editor-in-chief of Marie Claire. Dr. Julie Holland is a psychiatrist at the New York University School of Medicine and the author of Weekends at Bellevue, nine years on the night shift at the Psych ER. Good morning to both of you. Nice Good to morning, see you. Good How morning. did this hit your radar? Well, really, we were hearing from a lot of readers that they were feeling very stressed. I mean, clearly the economy is a, a great source of stress for people, and they wanted a way to unwind. And they found more and more of them were doing this, and they found it had less impact on them when they were going to work the next morning so they didn't want to drink uh, it's cheap and they felt they could do it in the privacy of their own home and it was a very effective way to come down that eight million number you we, we quoted in the piece that does not include teenagers who are experimenting with marijuana you're talking about the 18 to 49 year olds we're talking about highly functioning women who you you know these are not people who are lying on park benches the typical picture of someone who's addicted to drugs they're casual recreational users who find it very effective Th this comment that we just heard in the piece where it's it's just I use it instead of having a glass of wine after work how do you feel about that is it the same thing other than the fact that it's illegal well the fact that it's illegal is a very big deal you know people have to hide and they feel like criminals and there's a lot of shame and guilt it ends up making uh, you know, it decreases self-esteem a little bit and it makes it more adrenalized you know the fact that you add adrenaline into it that you have to hide and there's shame actually can make it feel more addictive it can make it more dangerous yeah, yeah, so I have to say that's not what we're hearing from readers I mean first of all it's decriminalized in 13 states and I don't think this is a generation of people who get excited about the fact it's illegal I think they try to 
in college and they're going back to something because these are times of real stress and I don't think they're excited by the fact it's illegal and honestly it's not very difficult to get that's the other thing right. well, one, we would talk to people who had dealers in their offices one woman in your piece said that it's like her bubble bath uh, right and but but it, when you make comments like that and I think what I was getting at with you doctor when you say equate it to a glass of wine are you ignoring a darker side of this issue well, it is a drug, like alcohol is a drug, or like coffee, caffeine, cigarettes. So, um, it's just, it's very different than alcohol. It's a, it's more of a mind drug. I feel alcohol is sort of a, a deadening, numbing, more, maybe like, more like a body drug. So, people are unwinding and they're relaxing, but they're also able to think and maybe analyze or think clearly, pull back and see the macro, maybe make some changes in their lives. I think that, that cannabis really is more of a psychotherapeutic drug. It could actually be more helpful than alcohol, certainly in terms of insomnia or depression, anxiety. It can potentially be a treatment or a medicine. And, and Joanna, post publication of this article, is the feedback from the viewers changing at all? Well, the feedback from our readers is really that they're very pleased that they recognize themselves. I mean, it's not a piece condoning it. It's a piece saying, look, this is going on. How do we feel about it? And a lot of people have written in saying, you know what, I do this too. And I'm really glad you've shone a light on it because I need to know other people are doing it. That's absolutely what I'm hearing. Yeah. And I think the, the behavior probably needs to be normalized. I think, you know, the countries that are regulated, they've got less use, not more. All right. Dr. Joanna, thanks very much. Flowers that can make your mind swirl. It's a funky plant with a fiber that is resistant to rain and mold. It's the strongest plant fiber known to man, the best rope you'll ever hold. Well, the pioneers covered up the wagon trains with a canvas made of hemp. And Washington and Jefferson grew it on their farms and said to make the most of it. The first stars and stripes were sewn on hemp, the first constitution too. This is around the world for food, fiber, oil, medicine, and fuel. And if we press the seeds, we won't have no need for any other oil. We can make paints and inks, or run our car, we'll go back next season. It'll fix the soil, the most nutritious seed we can put in our mouth with omega-6 and 3. We can feed the world with the tree of life and live sustainably. But if we cut down all the trees, we won't have nowhere to breathe. We can grow fields of hemp instead. And make our paper, build a house from it. It's the God's plan, grow wild and free. Living the way that we ought to be. Gonna leave my children a better world than my ancestors left me. Whoa, whoa. La, 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 la. be made into oil or rope. Some people say you smoke it and you feel fantastic, but from hemp you can make an alternative to plastic. Made from plants, not petroleum, you see, so it won't still be around in 4003. It can biodegrade, which means there'll be less pollution. Just another reason for a hemp revolution. Cancer and AIDS patients eat their food Helps those with depression overcome the blues Glaucoma, epilepsy, nausea, insomnia, stress, neurosis, psychosis, pain, PMS All the studies have been done and all the doctors agree But they can't make money off this plant, you see, because it's free It grows from a seed, wild and free like we ought to be You know the future is grown in our own backyards If we cut down all the trees, we won't have nowhere to be We'll grow fields of hemp instead can make our paper, build the house from it. It's the God's plan for wild and free. Living the way that we are, we gonna leave my children a better world than my ancestors left me. Whoa, whoa. La, 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 la. Whoa, whoa.
In 1930s, it was the billion dollar crop. With the invention of the quarter kit, they could produce it nonstop. But then a smear campaign with Mexicans to blame thought of making people thinking to make your brain go pop. Yeah, since then it's never stopped. It ain't like getting high for paint and crack rock. Time to bring it back to nature, time to bring back some life. Let the farmers do their job, stop giving them strike. Renewable resources, life giving forces. Panels for your cars and saddles for your horses. DuPont, Monsanto, making the wrong choices. Suicide genes extinguishing our voices. Cutting down the trees, polluting the seven seas. Leaving the fate of the planet to the corporate entities. Corrupt politics, warfare disease. Now it's time to make a change, it's time to plant seeds. Focus on the trees as you got oil and seeds. It gives you all the protein you will ever need. You can make it in a sandwich with jelly or jam. Or make it in a soap or a lotion for your hands. You can make it into fuel, put it right in a car. Then we won't need the oil and won't have to start work. You can make it into paper, write as much as you please. Cause it grows like a weed and we won't have to cut trees. So put your faith in him, such a versatile plan. And don't let the government tell us we can't. Cause hemp can help us all in so many ways. And it doesn't mean that we will all be living in a day's versatility, sustainability. Look at history, it ain't no mystery. Hemp for victory. because of it. Seattle's become the Amsterdam of the USA. Right? And, and that's because of everybody here working together to pull off this amazing event. I came into the park on Thursday. There must have been 400 volunteers, 400 people working for free, putting up this stage. Putting up the fences, putting up the signs, bringing in the trash containers. There's going to be 400 people here Monday cleaning up the cigarette butts and little stuff that we miss picking up ourselves on Sunday. So, I mean, this is an amazing change that we've brought about. I'm here to speak about a group called Drug Sense. Look us up, drugsense.org. We are a group of activists that work online. We have a, websites for drug policy for groups around the world that we host on our server. We have listservs for communications in all the different straight state drug policy forums. Um, Oh, I don't even know if Fest has its own uh, web services, but so many groups use us, there's probably uh, 100 of our clients here today. And uh, so I want you to look up drugsense.org. We have an online activism group that puts together now 150,000 articles about drug policy where we can chart the difference in the reporting of drug policy from now you know, from 10 years ago till now, we can show you how the media has changed in its coverage, how 
uh, how even debate about drug policy 10 years ago was taboo in the media, and now everybody's talking about it. Newspapers across the country are coming out for major changes in drug policy, and we have the Web Commission that everybody needs to push for that's going to take a comprehensive look at criminal policy. So everybody, we're having an effect. We need to get online and we need to get our act together. We need to come together at Hemp Fest and volunteer and get our act together. Both locally and online, we're having an effect. And I love the freedom that that is bringing us. We need to keep it and we need to keep pushing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Seattle. Love you, Donnie. Don Wurtschafter. One of the founders of the industrial hemp movement, I have you know. Legend has it that deep within the THC crystal of the marijuana plant, there lives a goddess. A goddess so incredible that meeting her will transform your life forever. She's magnificent, glorious, beautiful, delicious. I want to meet her. You start with a strain like this, nurture her, worship her. When your mind is open, she will come. When their leader is arrested, three friends will travel halfway across the world, plant 25,000 marijuana plants, and harvest more organic ganja than you and all of your friends could smoke in three lifetimes. Whoa, that's a lot of pot. You from America? Yep. So you think you can just come over to Europe, grow some weed, and make a whole bunch of money? It doesn't work like that. All I know is, after how some of y'all treated the son, the Lord felt the need to hide his daughter, and he hid her in the most sacred of sacred places. chance to get it right and to meet one goddess would you like to meet the green goddess I do It's a crisp spring morning in Manhattan. A perfect day for a march down Broadway. But on this day, for this crowd, the Big Apple isn't exactly rolling out the red carpet. There are delays and confusion about where to gather. Mayor Rudy Giuliani waits until the very last minute to issue the necessary permit. But several thousand show up anyway, and eventually this ragtag army begins the long trek to Battery Park. The marchers have all come together this day for various reasons, but with one common voice, to protest the United States policies on marijuana. The marchers are cordially escorted by a phalanx of New York's finest. Or so it seems. Business as usual in America's war on drugs. They're not gonna get rid of us that easy. For the last 30 years, a hardcore band of activists has been fighting the war on marijuana in what they see as a struggle for truth and justice. One man among them stands apart. He has been described as a cult folk hero, a boisterous rabble-rouser, a crazy man. 
His name is often mispronounced. He likes to say it rhymes with terror. But one thing is certain. Because of him, we enter the next millennium with a new knowledge of an ancient plant. A plant whose present day revival was sparked by this man's 1985 best-selling book. The book revealed the lost history of the hemp plant, and in doing so, lit a fire under a legion of followers the world over. Its title is, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Its author is known as the father of today's burgeoning hemp movement. His name is Jack Herrer. of age, Jack Herrer has been stumping for hemp nearly half his life. Okay, there Jack. Are, the Emperor of Hemp. <laughs> that was a great film. I, that was produced through the ages of uh, The Body Shop. The lady, what's her name? Anita Roderick? Um, yeah. She Anita died. Roderick? She just passed away yeah, recently. That's a shame. So when did this first come out? Was it? Nine, uh, in 2000. In 2000. Time flies. You, you've had a stroke since then, but you've come back well, a long way since then. Uh, about one month after... The, after this came out, you were here yeah, already I, with and that stroke. I, yeah, and I, yeah. I can't talk or walk for and You couldn't talk at three. all for a couple years. Yeah. And now I'm getting my voice back, mm -hmm. but I always had my attitude back. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs>